everybody have a, whew, a good day? I guess I was talking up and then I had to talk back down. I feel that. Okay, well, be on the lookout. We're starting our podcast tomorrow. Pretty excited about that. It's a video podcast, so me and Micah will be doing tomorrow's podcast and then the next one um, probably be me and David. And then after that, who knows where we'll end up. So, but it's, it's a lot of the, a lot of the things that people deal with. Like our first uh, podcast is going to be talking about Laodicea and the whole reason for that, um, the description that Jesus used to describe the church of Laodicea and where that all came from. I think it's pretty cool pretty fascinating yep we'll have them online so they'll be able to be accessed anytime pretty excited about it YouTube Facebook um, Twitter Instagram and uh, twitch so yeah <laughs> and then we'll maybe doing rumble and then uh, TikTok probably you know, there's people that use all of these av- these venues to, you know, whether it's news or whatever it is, and my goal is just to reach all of them. So we'll see how that goes. But all right, with that being the case, it is 6.01, which means it is time to get this show on the road. Who wants to open us up with a word of prayer? You guys, one at a time, one at a time. Who wants to open us up? You can always tell the ones that don't want to because they don't they avoid eye contact. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Okay, Miss Tammy, it's you. Amen. Thank you, Miss Tammy. So when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he found some disciples who had only been baptized in John's baptism. He instructed them that they should believe on Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul laid his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. Paul spoke boldly about the kingdom of God in the synagogue in Ephesus for three months. Some were hardened and spoke evil of the way. Paul then went to the school of Tyrannus, reasoning daily with the disciples. Paul continued this for two years. Galatians may have been written at this time. All of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God worked miracles through Paul Even handkerchiefs and aprons brought from Paul drove out diseases and evil spirits. Some itinerant Jewish exorcists called the name of the Lord Jesus to drive out evil spirits. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, did this as well. An evil spirit in a man recognized the name of Jesus and Paul, but did not recognize them. The, The man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. They fled naked and wounded. Sounds like he got the upper hand. Both Jews and Greeks heard of this in Ephesus, and the name of the Lord was magnified. Many who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them. The books were worth about 50,000 pieces of silver. The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. He sent Timothy and Erastus into Macedonia while he remained In Asia, 1 Corinthians may have been written at this time. A great commotion occurred about the way. Demetrius, a silversmith, called together those of similar occupation. Recognizing they prospered greatly from this trade of making idols, he warned that Paul was preaching that the idols were not gods which are made with hands. He proclaimed their trade was in danger, and even the temple of the goddess Diana was in danger. He claimed this preaching was happening throughout Ephesus and across most of Asia. 
the people were stirred up, became angry, and cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions. Paul wanted to go into the crowd, but the disciples would not allow it. The crowd was in great confusion. The Jews put Alexander forward to speak, but when the crowd realized he was a Jew, they cried out for about two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The city clerk calmed the crowd. He told Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen to take their cases to the open courts and that any other inquiry should be made in lawful assembly. <clears throat> this assembly was a disorderly gathering and they were in danger of being called in question. He then dismissed the assembly. This one is a fantastic, uh, fantastic chapter. And we're going to have a lot of fun with this one. You guys ready for some fun? <clears throat> is it possible to have fun reading the Word of God? Why not? Okay, so uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to uh, Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Now just a reminder... The end of last chapter was talking about Apollos, and he is now sharing Jesus completely. Do you remember what the problem was last chapter with Apollos? He didn't know Jesus. Everything that he had learned was from other teachers, but didn't really know Jesus completely. So he was taught completely. But I wanted to make mention of this here. Paul passed through the inland country, and depending on the version that you're using, some of them calling upland or uh, the high, high country, low country. So I wanted to bring that out. The upper coasts or inland country were referring primarily to Phrygia and Galatia. Um, they were referred to as upper because they were situated on high table land in the interior of Asia Minor while Ephesus was in the low maritime regions and generally referred to as the low country. So when you hear low country and high country, that's what they're talking about. Paul had promised to make a return in Acts chapter 18, verse 21. We talked about that when he had to leave to go to the feast. Do you remember that? He said, I will be back. Well, Acts chapter 19, he is back. So here he is doing just that. Okay. You guys following along so far? All right, who has verse 2? Now, I believe that this simply means Paul encountered these men who had heard the message of John the Baptist and believed. That message... Paul is asking them if they have received Holy Spirit, because if they have, it means that they are Jesus followers, and he can proceed with discipleship. But they said that they have never heard of the Holy Spirit. This is a strong indication they don't really know Jesus. So he taught them Jesus and then laid hands on them. And then we see in verse 3, and he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. This verse is a strong indication. They received what John the Baptist was teaching. They were listening. They received it, but had very limited knowledge of Jesus Christ. All right, who has verses 4 and 5? All right. And then uh, who has six and seven? And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve of them in all. Twelve men in all. And then uh, verses eight and nine. Anybody?
Okay. So who is this that they're talking about here, speaking evil of the way? What is that? Who is the way? That sounds like a scripture I know. The way, the truth, the life. So who are we talking about here? Jesus, that's right, you got it. So he's preaching boldly about the way, Jesus Christ. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way. Listen, we've heard this for all 18 chapters that we studied before this. There were always somebody there ready to pounce, ready to discredit the disciples, whether it was Peter or Paul, didn't matter. Um, so in this case, Tyrannus. I wanted uh, everybody to be aware, Tyrannus was the owner of the lecture hall or school in Ephesus. Not much else is known of him other than it's likely he rented this out to, based on what I've researched, philosophers and teachers. So this was just a place where people could go and share anything that they were ready to teach. But then in verse 10, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So this went on for two years teaching. Two years, which is an indication, slow and steady wins the race. It wasn't jumping in there and in a month later, blasting off. He stayed there and he devoted his time to making sure people knew, they didn't just know the word, they didn't just know Jesus, what would be the purpose of teaching them for two years? What, is there enough to teach in two years? What was the point here? Okay, patience. Okay, David, did you have something? Sure. I like that. Building relationships. The first thing that popped in my mind was discipleship. Getting these guys ready to share the gospel wherever they went. Because that's what it was about this, this, during this time, right? Was making sure people were equipped to go out and share the gospel with anybody that they encountered. And I believe that all of these answers are right. And I think it was a matter of making sure they were ready. You don't want to stop before they're ready to go. You don't want to leave before they're ready. What's going to happen if you have a church that you've started somewhere and then you leave before they're ready for you to leave? What's going to happen? They're going to scatter. They're going to fall apart. You've got to make sure they're ready to go. Okay. So then in, um, who has uh, verse 11 and 12? Does anybody else have anything before we move on? Okay. I don't think there's anything too crazy here. Okay, awesome. So was there something special about the handkerchiefs and aprons. Well, wait a second. They were healing and casting out devils. Wasn't there something special? I'm trying to trick you guys. I'm trying to trick you guys. So I say no as well. I don't believe that there was. It was all about faith, right? Faith, faith. Did Jesus ever heal without touching? We know he did. We know for a fact that he did. Um, it was about faith, right? God will use whatever means necessary to make a point. And the reason I say that, prime example, he healed the blind in many different ways, didn't he? First time we see this, Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 31, he healed by touch. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, he healed by spitting in the man's eyes. 
Figure that one out. Luke chapter 18, verse 35, he healed by words only, never touched him. John chapter 9, verse 1, he healed by putting clay in the man's eyes. I believe it's however God leads to do it. There's a point for this. In this case, I believe it was a similar incident with the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus looked at her and he said, what? Who, well, he said, who touched, who touched me? I felt power leaving me. What happened? She said, I'm sorry, but I needed healing. And he said, it wasn't the hem of my garment, was it? What did he say? Your faith has made you whole. Your, your faith has healed you. Had nothing to do with the hem of his garment. I believe just standing in his presence, if she had believed that way, she could have been healed. But she thought that that was what was necessary. Okay. Any thoughts? All right. And then verse 13. Just jump on in there. Now, to me, um, when we read this, well, let me look at my question first. So when we read this, to me, this is what we're talking about when, when it says that there were those who stood before and said, Lord, Lord, did I not do these things in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? And I think that's these people, people like this. So King James refers to these Jews as vagabonds. What does that mean? Have, you have to understand, vagabonds back then doesn't quite meet the same thing as it does today. So, what do you think it means? I mean, it's hard to say, I guess, if I've already told you that that doesn't, doesn't mean the same thing. But basically, translated from the Greek, it means Jews going about. So they were like transients, right? In this case... These were Jews who wandered from place to place, practicing exorcism. In this case, pretending to be able to expel evil spirits. These Jews clearly didn't believe in Jesus like they were supposed to, by Jesus whom Paul preaches. We see here, um, I adjure you, in the, at the end of verse 13, he says, I adjure you by the, Jew, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. It's almost as if it was secondhand information. Like, they didn't believe in Jesus, but Paul has the power because of Jesus, so we're going to claim Jesus. Right? Doesn't work like that, does it? So these guys were proclaiming Jesus. Uh, verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Chief of priests here does not mean that he was ruler of all Jews. That's not what we're talking about. It just means that he was likely of the sacerdotal order and likely a ruler in the Sanhedrin. So we're talking about somebody who is clearly um, in the priesthood, as it were, but and possibly even in the Sanhedrin, but... Um, but that does not mean that he was a ruler of all Jews. That's not what that implies. And then uh, verse 15. Now, I wrote it down in here, but it truly did make my hair stand up. Have you, I mean, if you've, because I've been there where, where demons have been cast out. I've seen it firsthand, and I'm telling you right now, if, if I had went to pray over somebody who's demon-possessed, and they said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? I would run. That's a good indication you need to leave. <clears throat> if you're, <laughs> I just put down here, if you ever get into that situation where demons don't know, who you, don't know you like Jesus and Paul, you better run. 
Um, <clears throat> okay. And then verse 16, And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And I have a high level of confidence that was not a brief encounter. They probably were thankful that they escaped with their life. I think. These were followers of the priest who, who I don't believe had Holy Spirit at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, and that's the case there. Seven sons. So, but they got, they got, they got wasted. And then verse 16, um, Okay, and then verse 17. Who has verse 17? So this, these guys were destroyed, okay? They were absolutely shredded. And then verse 17. So read of what happened very quickly all through Ephesus, which is the center of the life. And Saul and Peter became comfortable, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Greatly honored. So great fear. What do you think that means? Do you think they're talking about the, the fear, or do you think they're talking about respect? What do you think? Based on what we see in future verses, I would be more inclined to say it was a great level of respect for God. Because we, we see here um, in verse 18, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. They said, this is power. We don't want, we want that. We don't want what we have now. And then who has verse 19? And the number of these who practice magic are brought to full together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So there's no going back. What's the significance behind burning those books? You can't change your mind in a little bit. It's done. And that's how resolved they were to cancel this, to say, I've had enough. But just to give you an idea, 50,000 pieces of silver, I wanted you to see, worth about $5.5 million by today's money. That's a lot of books. That's, that's, a, that's a bonfire. All right, and then verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. All right, who has 21 and, tw uh, let's do 21. Okay, we don't know exactly why he decided to make a trip to Jerusalem. However, it's likely it was to give money to the poor saints in Jerusalem, as outlined in Romans chapter 15, verses 25 and 26. Just FYI. And then 22, and having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Stayed in Asia for a while. Timothy because he had been there with Paul previously. Um, to establish these churches, we see that in Acts chapter 16, verse 3, and Acts chapter 17, verse 14. So there's a history there with Timothy, which is one of the reasons why he sent him. Erastus was the, was the treasurer of Corinth. So this guy was clearly proficient at dealing and handling with money. Um, so a great person to handle the money. Any thoughts so far? All right. You guys are quiet tonight. Is it the weather? Everybody have a big supper? All right. Who has 23 and 24?
Right, right. So we look at Diana. Diana has many names, and you will see these, these names in various places. In the heavens, she was Luna or Mao. I don't know how you say that. The moon on earth, Diana. And in hell, Hecat, Hecate. He also, um, also named Lucina, Pros Proserpine, Trivia, etc. She was known to the Romans as Diana, but to the Greeks as Artemis. Has lots of names. These who gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. So what was their wealth? They were silversmith, but what was the point? What was, how did they make money? That was a big business for them. This was a big area for this. So they, they were making lots and lots of money. Um, he says, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. But then in verse 26, who has that one? So what is Paul doing here? What is it, I mean, based on what you read in verse 26, what is it that Paul's doing that has them so upset? <coughs> Taking their business. How's he doing that? Okay, that their idols are worthless, right? Well, we know that they are, right? Because they're just, there's no God like that. We have one God. So in this case... This isn't the first time Paul tried to persuade the people away from false gods. We see this also in Acts chapter 14, verses 14 and 15. This is an ongoing project, isn't it? It's kind of like when he, when he went strolling into to Athens, and all of the, he, it says he, he became, his, stir, his uh, spirit became stirred, right? What was that for? Because of all the idol worshiping. So this is something that he's going to encounter throughout his days, at least until he dies. And then verse uh, 27. Not only were they losing money, but now this great god or goddess, Artemis or Diana, is now being discredited. It just blows my mind that there are people that worship these gods that they've never seen, never seen the hand of. Just makes me curious. And then in verse 28, when they heard this, they were enraged, nothing new there, and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Or great as Diana. And then verse 29. Aristarchus? Well, to hurt Paul, right? You gotta you gotta take his traveling companions and hurt them. That's how it works. And then in verse 30, but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. So they feared that maybe something bad might happen to Paul if he had gone in there since they were enraged, which is what the Bible says. But in verse 31, who has that one? I know there's a hard word there, it's Ajarks. Okay, so Asiarchs, which is what I have here on the sheet, were over sacred things and public games. While it's not evident they, that they were con converts, they clearly had a great level of respect for Paul and his cause. Okay, and then verse 32, now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Isn't that how it works? Mass hysteria. 
hey, there seems like everybody's fighting. Let's get in on this. That seems to be how it works, right? Most of the riots that I've ever seen on TV were the same way. People started rioting. Next thing you know, people are like, what's going on? Hey, free TV. I'm going there. Let's, do the, let's get this done. So then in who has verse 33? That's okay tonight? 33. <laughs> I just wanted to be clear, this is not Alexander the Great. I know when we see Alexander, sometimes it's easy to just make the assumption. Now, we don't know exactly know which Alexander this is, but my research... Uh, but it has been discussed that this is Alexander the coppersmith who had done much harm to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Though we don't know that conclusively, but that is what they believe. That's who that is. Okay. And then verse 34, but when they, when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We see that now, don't we? When you watch on the news uh, a presidential candidate getting up on stage, or you see in the uh, Congress, you know, when they're doing an address, we're seeing that more and more, aren't we? Why? Why would you see that? There's one purpose. <laughs> when you see that, it doesn't matter which side it is, you still see this happening. And it's to shut them down, to shut them up. And that's what they're trying to do here. Um, so they had taken Alexander and they started proclaiming. Once they found out he was a Jew, they figured, what's, what's a Jew going to do? He's obviously going to side with Paul. Would you agree? Likely. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians is what they proclaimed for two hours a lot of that's a lot of chanting all right who has a uh, 35 so what he, what he's saying here is this you think some guys coming into town is going to change our reputation and what we do? We are worshipers of Artemis. We are worshipers of Diana. It doesn't matter what they do. Just let them be. Because it's not going to change who we are. But I think it will. All right, and then verse 36. How about 36 and 37? That makes it fun. Okay, um, so in verse 36, he is saying, <coughs> these things can't be denied. We are who we are, but he goes on to say, don't do anything rash. What was the whole point behind this? Why is it he's telling them to simmer down? Remember, who's in control here? Who is in control in this area? The Romans. What happens, I mean, you see how jumpy they are. Even a small collection of people together, and they get suspicious. Now they have a large collection of people together, and they are enraged, probably yelling and screaming and throwing things. So the Romans catch wind of this. What's going to happen? They're going to come down like a hammer, and they're going to say, no more of this. And it could have cost the people who worshipped Diana and Artemis or Artemis, it could have cost them their time with their God. So he's saying, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. Leave them alone. They're not going to change who we are. And then uh, in verse 38...
Anybody? Okay, so that's the proper way to do it, isn't it? They don't want the Romans involved. Let's just keep this civil. If you have a complaint, let's lodge it with the authorities and let them handle it. Let's not, let us not do this right now. But in verse 39, he says, but if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. I think his whole purpose here, his whole plan was to shut him down so that there was no unneeded attention. And then who has 40 and 41? So verse 40 definitely testifies to what I'm saying. He says, we are in danger of being charged with rioting today. And I don't know what the penalty was for that, but I'm guessing it was probably pretty severe. Okay. A lot of verses there. We made pretty good time. So what is it you gathered from this chapter tonight? What is it that really stuck out to you? It said something for you. Anybody? The power of the testimony of Christ. That uh, the people, uh, the leaders were afraid because they knew that people could be persuaded into this faith mm -hmm. by being so powerful. True enough. Which is exactly why they try shutting us down overseas. A lot of places in China won't even, in fact, if I mention China and Jesus in the same sentence, they won't even let me broadcast it on YouTube in China. That's, that's what I'm talking about. They want to shut him down because the name of Jesus is that powerful. And this guy who was speaking was telling them, just relax. They're not going to change us. That's not true. Jesus is more powerful than that. Anything else? What is it that really grabbed your attention in this chapter and said, wow, that's really pretty cool? Okay, I like that. Do we have a job? We all have a job. Anybody else? Uh, verse 19. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. Uh, that speaks out to me because I guess personally I'm in a similar situation where to advance forward, I have to make that step. I can't take back. Amen. But that's important, isn't it? When we get to a place where we're burning the books, we're saying enough is enough. I don't want second best. I want the best. I don't want God's skimmings. I want God's full glory, right? That any Christian I know is, well, they will say the same thing. I don't want just this much of what God has for me. I want it all. I want everything that God has. I don't want to leave anything on the table. That should be our goal. Everybody, every Christian worth their salt should be their, that goal. Yes, sir.
true enough. Anybody else? Did this really speak to you at all, this chapter? How can we apply it? That is true. People think it's clear cut. It's just as easy as whipping in and whipping it out. That's not how this works. You got to be very careful. Uh, make so much teensy silversmiths mad. I was saying, you can avoid a riot if you just pivot your business model one. Okay, what statue this big for 10 pieces of silver? Turn that into 100 crosses for one piece of silver. <laughs> I like it. You 10 times your profit. Now let's start a riot. <laughs> and you never know, they may have. You never, you never can tell because it's all about the money, isn't it? All right. So moving on here. What, what two questions did we see that Paul asked the disciples he first encountered in Ephesus? Two things. One, did you receive Holy Spirit when you believed? And two, in verse three, he asked them another question. What was that? And to what were you baptized? And number three, when Paul told them they should believe on Jesus, what did they do? Baptized. baptized in the name of Jesus. Makes it easy. And, ver and number four, Paul taught in the synagogue and in the school of Tyrannus for more than two years. What were the results of his effort? All who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. What were brought from Paul's body to heal the sick and drive out evil spirits? And I think that could still work. That doesn't change anything. Um, I think it's still all a matter of faith. And I always, I always hearken back to the centurion. When the centurion came to Jesus and said, what? I have a servant, right? That needs healing. And what did Jesus say? I don't have time for you today. No. What did he say? What did he tell him? He said, take me to him. I'm not even worthy that you should enter my home, but I know that if you just say the words, my servant will be healed. And what happened? What did Jesus say? Do what? Yes. And he said, this very hour, what? Your servant is healed. Done. That easy. I guess if it were so easy, we'd all do it. But hey, we still see it, right? We still see the power of God move. We still see healing and we still see miraculous things happen. All right. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Ephesians, which is uh, you know, a book of the Bible, is, is an offspring of some of this writing and stuff that took place while we, while we live in the Bible. That's true, and that's such a good point, because that's why I said they were wrong. Because they, they diminished the power of God, diminished diminish the power of the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you what, they made a big mistake, and it worked out in God's favor. <laughs> okay, so uh, number six, what did the itinerant Jews, exorcists, take up upon themselves to do when driving out evil spirits? <laughs> Paul was the proxy. How does that work? That'd be like me standing up here praying over somebody and saying, I, I proclaim healing over your body by Paul through Jesus Christ. That's crazy. These guys did not know what they were doing. Did not know. Huh? It's yes. Um, so what resulted when the seven sons of Sceva attempted this? That's one of my favorite parts of chapter 19. I do not know. <laughs> Indeed. 
beat them, and they were naked. <laughs> naked. Okay, when this became known to Ephesus, what resulted? Think about that. Something like this happened in our, our own town. People would be like, whoa, that's amazing. So what happened to the people at Ephesus? Filled with fear, what kind of fear are we talking about? Respect. Respect. You know, it's like, it's like fear the Lord, right? When we're talking about fearing the Lord, what are we talking about? Is it one of these? Oh, no, please. No, it's not that, right? It's respect. We've got to respect the Lord. Why do we respect? Because he has the power. He is God, right? He's got the power to end things just like that and the power to start things just like that. If you don't think our lives can be taken from us just like that, you're crazy. He can do anything he chooses to any moment. Okay. Uh, number nine, where did Paul purpose in the spirit to go? To Jerusalem. Do you know why? It's speculated. It's like I was saying in verse 21. It was likely, if you read Romans chapter 15, 25 and 26, it talks about his trip to Jerusalem to give to the poor Jews. So they believe that this is probably where he was going and for what purpose. Where did Paul send Timothy and Erastus? In verse 22, Macedonia. What did Demetrius tell his fellow silversmiths that Paul had persuaded almost all Asia? Right. That thing is driving me crazy. Um, but it does make sense. Who believes that you could create a God made from human hands that could actually do anything? That's almost like passing our imperfections onto a silver statue and saying, let's worship this silver statue. It's just nuts. It's crazy. They still do. But let's face it, anything that we put above God is an idol. Would you agree? Anything, whether it's TV or cars or money, anything like that can be an idol. Anything. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> let's see, number 12. What did Demetrius say could happen as a result? Your trade may come into disrepute. Disrepute, yeah. <clears throat> the temple of Diana may be despised, which it should be. Diana's magnificence may be destroyed. Oh, no. Hate to see that. When the crowd rose up, what did they cry? They weren't having it. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. All right, guys, I think that is about it. I guess I got a few more questions here. Um, Why do you think that they stopped, based on number 14, why do you think it was that they stopped Paul from going in there? They were angry. Do you think they would have done something to Paul? Because he was kind of the ringleader, wasn't he? Okay. Do what? All right. So who finally quieted the crowd? The city clerk, yeah. Um, how did the city clerk say the image came to be in Ephesus? Verse 35. Fall from the sky. Fall from the sky. Fell down from Zeus. Uh, where did the city clerk tell Demetrius and his fellow silversmith to take their cases? To the open courts, right? To the proconsuls. What was a proconsul? Governor. Yeah. <laughs> What was this assembly in danger of? What was this assembly in danger of doing, in, in danger of being in trouble of? Rioting. Rioting. For, no good reason. For no good reason. And I'm kind of curious now. I'm going to have to look that up, and I'll tell you guys next week. But I'm thinking it had to have been a pretty serious crime 
I don't know what they would have done with all of them, but they might have thrown them all in jail. I don't know. Anybody know what the crime is for rioting in ancient Roman times? Uh, probably not. All right. Well, I'm going to stop there tonight. I guess we got done a few minutes early. Oh, wow. I don't know if you could have threw that many people in jail. Maybe they just got the troublemakers. All right. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, rebuttals? All right. Let's pray. Um, Father, I just thank you for your presence this evening. I thank you for uh, showing us truth. And I just pray, Father, for our people uh, that we would be bold in our faith. Father, uh, as we continue through Acts, I just proclaim that you continue to reveal truths to us. Uh, that we would draw closer to you, Father. Your word tells us that if we draw closer to you, you draw closer to us. Father, help us to never be full, to always be needy, to always wanting more of you, craving and desiring more. And um, Father, I just pray that you're with us this week. Give us a divine appointment. Help us to share our faith. Be, help us to be bold. Give us strength to be bold. And uh, we love you, Father. We thank you and we praise you for all you do. Um, Father, you're so good to us. We love you. We truly love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at that. You guys get to go home a few minutes early tonight. Now, I want to thank you all for coming, seriously. This is important stuff. <laughs>